Welcome everyone to episode 18 of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Josh, and I am the host of this podcast, where every week we talk about a real-life issue for Christians, usually for someone who listens to the show or is a friend of mine who has approached me with a topic wanting to know how does faith intersect with that? How do the scriptures intersect with that? How does the church intersect with that? And I do my best to keep this podcast grounded and to keep it applicable to daily life. So as a result, I do my best to avoid theological language and really academic language. I, I want to keep this accessible and grounded if possible. Occasionally, I will use a, I guess, a theological or a academic term, but I, again, I do my best to try and define very clearly what I mean by that, because occasionally those terms can be very helpful. So, that's the background of the show. This week specifically, we're going to be talking about something that is going to make some of you want to immediately shut off this podcast. And for a lot of the rest of you, at some point during the podcast, you might want to shut it off. But before I even reveal the topic, I, I want to encourage you to listen and to listen through all the way and give genuine consideration to the things I have to say, whether or not you like them. And all of that buildup is because this week we are discussing politics. This is a topic courtesy of a buddy of mine, his name's Kevin, and the original que- to be fair, the original question was, do you have to be a Republican to be Christian? And the original answer, the very easy answer to that is, no, you do not. But I'm expanding that, and I'm going to talk about politics kind of in general. Feel free to submit topics like Kevin did, and I will add them to my list, and I will get to them, I will talk about them. As we go forward into this topic, though, this is a topic that I think and I know people are uncomfortable with. For example, yesterday I told my wife that I had prepared this podcast, and her first reaction was, gross. (laughs) But I'm going to ask you to please stick with me. I am going to be as honest as humanly possible, Bible and faith first, second, And third, I have to be completely honest with you, I don't really have an affiliation either way as far as the political spectrum. So, this is not coming from a super, I mean, I'm sure I have my biases, but politically speaking, I really don't care for either party, either end of the spectrum. So, and here's how I'm going to approach it today. I'm going to start off the, our first section, we're going to talk about politicians, Not specific politicians, politicians in general. And second, we're going to talk about issues, which I think, personally, I care a lot more about, specific issues. And then that's going to lead us into our final topic today, which is going to be political parties. Now, one more thing, this is probably the most disclaimers I've ever had before a podcast, there are tangents There are tangents I'm going to try to avoid in this podcast, but I can make them into entirely separate podcasts if you want. The reason I'm not going to get into them today is because they are related to, but they are not the topic at hand, and each one of them would take more time than this podcast has. So, those include the following five tangents. Number one. America is not God's chosen nation. God has only ever chosen one nation above the others, and that was Israel. And with the coming of Jesus Christ, that expanded to all of the faithful people. All people who are in Christ. So, America, not God's chosen nation. Second, America, in a lot of ways has always been and continues to be more deist than it is Christian. That's theological terms. So I'm going to talk, deism is faith in a God, but it's kind of just a general God that is more convenient for 
practical purposes than a specific God who actually tells you what to do. So, this argument that America is a Christian nation, eh, I don't know about that. But again, that's a tangent I'm not going to get into. America doesn't care about America, sorry, God doesn't care about America's cultural identity or border security. If you want my discussion on that, I did an entire podcast on immigration. Uh, I believe I called it Real Immigration, Real Gospel. So, if that is the tangent you want to hear more about, just, just go listen to the podcast I already did. The next tangent is the government doesn't define our morality. And then finally, you won't convince someone to change their mind on Facebook. Facebook is what we call an echo chamber. It's a psychological phenomenon where if you are in a group of people who agree with you, your opinions tend to get more and more extreme. So when you post something political on Facebook, one of two things is going to, one of three things is really going to happen. Thing number one is someone is going to have the same mindset as you and they are going to lift you up. They're going to compliment the status. They're going to like it, whatever that looks like. They're going to share it. And that is what creates the echo chamber because the other two are someone who disagrees pretty strongly with you and occasionally I guess they might argue with you, but more often than not, they're just going to unfollow you. Or Facebook's algorithms are going to keep you out of their feed. As a result, you're not really getting that honest discussion most of the time. And then the third option is they're going to be like me and they're going to roll their eyes at you pretty hard and keep scrolling. So that's just a plug. Don't putting things on all caps in Facebook doesn't convince anyone of anything politically. So just stop. You're being a bad witness. Anyway, sorry. Again, tangent. And these are all tempting tangents for me to talk about in like... It's, it's, we're seven minutes into the podcast and I haven't even really started talking about politics. So without further ado, this is real politics, real gospel. And our first Bible passage for this comes from Psalm 146. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. O my soul, I will praise the Lord. As long as I live, I will sing praises to him, uh, to have my, to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes and a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. So some context for this, some textual notes, because I do hate taking verses out of context. This is taken from within a psalm, and the rest of the psalm is encouraging people, is lifting up those who put their trust in God. And you may say, well, why why are you bringing this up then, Josh? Well, at a fundamental level, I think this is a reminder that princes, that politicians, are human. They will die, and all of their plans die with them. So, what I want to take away from this is we are not called to put our trust in princes. We are not called to put our trust in politicians. And my question is, what does that look like today? This looks like putting all of your hope in someone getting elected. So if you say something like, I don't know what I'm going to do if this other person wins, you have put your trust and your faith in a politician. If you despair when someone doesn't get elected or you despair when someone does, you have put your faith in a politician. And if you have this belief that politicians are going to put this country where it needs to be, you're putting your trust in a politician, and it's just wrong because they can't do anything that God doesn't allow them to do. The The fundamental truth is this. Politicians cannot save you. God is the only one who can, who can do that. And he can work with through whoever's in that office. And no one is going to be getting into any political office if God is not allowing them to do so. So we, we do genuinely have this problem in our society of putting our trust in politicians. 
whether it be politician in election season, you see this all the time. People saying this person's going to fix all of our problems or this person's going to cause all of our problems. But I think even when it's not an election time, you have everyone putting their trust in, in what politicians are doing. You're not everyone. You have a lot of people putting all their trust in, for example, in, in the current crisis, you have people looking to Congress and the the governors and the the authorities that be for the answers to everything. And the reality is what we should be doing is praying about it and caring about our neighbor in, in our actions, whether that be genuinely doing the social distancing thing, taking care of the people around us, going grocery shopping for others, and putting others well-being before our own so that's this i guess bit on trust in politicians which is what we're called here not to be doing because the reality is that politicians are human they will make mistakes and they they'll do good things because god works in them just like he works in you just like he works in me but they will make mistakes, and the, the reality to those mistakes is they deserve forgiveness and compassion and love just like everyone else. If you make a mistake, do you want people just yelling at you on social media and on the news and in the streets about it? No. You want to be forgiven. You want to be shown compassion and say you still have value as a person even though you're, you're doing this thing that you shouldn't be doing. And the reality is, is I see a lot of this from both sides. People who, who are tend to be more democratic, they I, I've seen so many posts about how terrible Trump is and how he's an idiot and saying all these mean things about him. And it, it sounds almost kind of elementary that I would say he, they're saying mean things about him, but the reality is that's what's happening. Like, first of all, we ought to be more mature than that. And second of all, we, we ought to be more loving than that. And on the flip side, I see Republicans in, in my news feed doing the same thing to uh, Chuck Schumer, I think is his name, or Nancy Pelosi, or all these other Democrats, or uh, Al- I know her as AOC. I, I think it's Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Um, I apologize if I... If I'm recalling her name incorrectly, but I see them posting thing after thing about how they're sinners and they're going to hell and they're mean and they're idiots and all these things. And and that's not what we're called to do. That is not what we're called to as Christians. We are, we are, we are to love. And there is this reality, and I know some of you are immediately going to respond to your computers with this, or maybe you'll even message me, which I would, I would love. I love to actually have conversations with people. But there is a, a precedent in the Bible for correcting people who are in error, for rebuking those who are in sin, and that is correct. But if you go back to my podcast on Real Conflict, Real Gospel... We're not called to take that to Facebook. That is all to be in the context of a relationship to win our brother or sister. So just yelling to your friends on Facebook about how terrible a politician is, is is not a biblical way to rebuke. It's just not. Because when we correct one another, it should be out of love and care for the well-being of the other, of our brothers and sisters, not for power or vengeance or because they disagree with us on some political things. So, and here's, here's another tangent I'm going to throw in, because as I am thinking about Facebook and people doing political things on Facebook, the whole praying for political leaders on Facebook... I, I'm not going to say don't do it, but I here's, I think, the reality. A lot of it is your politically grandstanding in the form of a prayer. Like, you have a political rant, so you start off with, Dear God, and end with Amen, and have a political rant in the middle, which I think is inappropriate. And also, we're told in the New Testament that the, the Pharisees are knocked for praying on street corners where everyone can see and hear them. 
So I think Facebook counts as that. So if you are praying for a politician on Facebook, maybe it's not the best thing to do. Anyway, that's a tangent. Sorry. Moving forward, the, the this kind of leads into this idea, you know, politicians can't save you. We shouldn't put our trust in them. Politicians are human. And it leads to this conclusion of don't idolize politicians. And some ways people do this idea of letting politics define you or the people you spend time with. If one of the first things you say, if I was to ask, who are you? And one of the first things out of your mouth is, I am a Republican. I am a Democrat. That's, that's identifying you. That, that's your identity. Uh, expecting the world to change based on politics. And, and putting all of your faith in politics to change the world instead of in Christ. That's putting a lot of trust in politics. And so there's this reality. Don't make politics, don't make politicians your God. Because we have a God that's so much better and higher and more wonderful than anything we see on this earth. Why would we take politics and politicians instead of him? So the application of this, um, how, how do you take this into your life? The first is, if it doesn't sound like something Jesus would say to them, don't say it on, on Facebook or on in comments or when you're having a conversation with someone who disagrees with you. I think asking what, what would Jesus have me do in this situation would be appropriate. Let forgiveness, love, and compassion lead. That's that's what the gospel is all about. And don't give politicians more power over you than they actually have. Don't let them define your outlook on life or your beliefs or your morality. They're just managers of the authority that God has given them. Don't give them more power than that. So this reality is that politicians have become an idol for all sorts of people. They are not gods. They are just people like you and me. That is the reality. But the gospel here is that God is in control. He loves us. He loves you. He loves me. He loves every politician in the country and in the world. And he will take care of what needs to be taken care of. He works through whoever is in charge. We don't have to worry and fret about who is in charge and be anxious about that because God is in control. And that's the gospel I have. For, and that's the, the introductory section we have on politicians. And from there, we're going to move into Matthew 22, starting at verse 17, where it says, Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. When they heard it, they marveled. And they left him and went away. So this this comes uh, just previous to Jesus' crucifixion and, and the story of his passion. And it's, it's a teaching. The, they approach Jesus... The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, this this group that's constantly out to get him. And they ask him this question because the reality is if he says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes, the Romans are not going to appreciate that. And they did not have, it did not take much for the Romans to incarcerate, punish, and, and crucify someone. And if he says, you should pay taxes, and the Romans aren't mad at him, all of the Jewish people who follow him, who are around him, are not going to listen to a thing he has to say because he is on the side of the oppressors. So, this is one example of an issue and kind of what I want this to lead into is, it's going to be the text I use for one of these issues, but the reality is, 
in, in the section part, I thought the core of a lot of our political discussions really ought to be the issues themselves, and we ought to look at each issue on a on an issue by issue basis. But there is a reality to this that I really ought to have a biblical text for each issue. So what I am going to do is I'm going to go forward and I'm going to go through these issues. And there is a reality that I'm not going to be grounding them as as firmly in the scriptures as I would like to. If you have doubts or questions or, or you think I'm off base on any of these, please message me, email me, comment. So I can, I can give you where I'm coming from on this. So anyway... Going forward, I, I want to talk about the issues, and the the text that we just read comes up to some of them, but I the response is, the, what I want to take out of that is Jesus didn't really agree with either the the Romans or the Jews, these, these two authorities at the time. He decided based on the issue what was right. And he spoke very specifically to a an issue here instead of to a party or to a group or to a platform. So with that, we're going to get into the issues. And this is according to Gallup polls, what the most important issues to voters at the last midterm election was. So I know this data is a little out of date, but it was the most recent confirmable data I could find. So the first uh, the first issue that is up for discussion is immigration. In summary, the Christian response to immigration is that we ought to be seeking immigration reform and we ought to be loving our neighbor, but there is a balance to be struck with law. Like I said at the beginning, that is a tangent. I could spend a whole podcast on it. I already did. It's called Real Immigration, Real Gospel. I would encourage you to go listen to it. The next issue is abortion. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to jump on this right away. The Republicans have this right. Outlaw abortion. Yes and no. Murder is wrong. That's that's in the Ten Commandments. That's consistent. That I, I believe actually almost everyone in the world that you ask would say, yes, murder is wrong. So in that way, yeah, yes. Uh, on the other hand, I think where Republicans fail on this is there is a failure to support struggling parents. There is a broken foster and ado- adoption system that, as far as I'm aware, no one is really seriously trying to help or build up or fix. And they're soft on the causal problem. You'll, you'll see a lot of people protesting abortion and a lot of people grandstanding against abortion, but you, you, you don't see people protesting in the streets saying, keep your pants on until you're married. You don't see, you know, good old boys telling their sons, don't, don't have sex with, pe- with, with women before you're married, which is the causal problem in case you were unaware. Um... So, there are faults on both sides of this issue. But there is the core of the issue that, yes, murder is wrong. Uh, Abortion is wrong. But there are a lot of other issues that are connected to that that we need to handle a lot better. So, in, in reality, both sides are wrong on that issue. Next, we have gay marriage, which, of course, I think is a tangent, so I'm not going to go super into depth. But the reality is this, you can't legislate morality. So whether it's legal or not, that that's, I, I think, tangential to the point. We, we ought to be teaching morality. We ought to be teaching healthy family structures. Um, and I think there is this this reality and I'm going to use some theological language here so I'm going to define it I'm going to use two kingdom language and there are a lot of different ways that people talk about the two kingdoms but I think one of the most helpful is kind of the temporal kingdom versus the eternal kingdom so you have the 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 kingdom of the government 
which is taking care of protecting people. At its core, the, the, the government's primary job in the world is the safety of people. Whereas the church's job in the eternal realm is to teach and to, and to bring forward the gospel and to teach what Jesus did and said and taught. So, there's this reality that it's not the government's job to, to curb sin, to curb homosexuality. That's the church's job to teach and to build up and, and to do and to do all those things. So there's I'm kind of avoiding the issue because I think it's a, a poorly framed issue. So moving on, we have the economy. Money shouldn't be an idol either. So there's this reality, and we are called to help our neighbors. So th- this is one of the things where I personally, I agree, I think, more with the Democratic Party than I do with the Republican Party. Because the Democrats do genuinely have a drive to help the poor and the disenfranchised and the hungry and those who are suffering and, and those who don't have as much as they need. And, and you can say you can say it's for bad reasons or you can say they're just trying to get power or, or what and the reality is they care they they genuinely want to do things for people who can't do them on their own and we can talk about their strategies for doing those and how those can be improved but the, that's something that I think the the Democratic Party the left side of the, the American political spectrum is more in line with Christian values than the Republicans tend to be so when it comes to the economy the, there is a call to help our neighbor and and whatever that impact on the economy might be and and again like that could be a whole nother podcast and then the next one I want to talk about is healthcare. This I want to I want to remind you of the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan takes this guy to a hotel, tells the hotel owner, "Take care of him. Whatever it takes. When I come back, if I haven't already given you enough money, I will give you more." He says, "Make take care of this man. Make this man well, regardless of the cost. He is truly putting his neighbor's health and well-being first. And that's what we ought to be doing when it comes to discussions about health care. Um, another issue that people really cared about was environmentalism. I ha- Someone has already asked me for a podcast on that. So I'm going to save that discussion for my upcoming podcast. So a- as you see, as you go through these issues, uh, each problem should be examined on its own. And... A follow-up to that is no political party is right all of the way down the board. So there is this, re- this, there's this reality. There is this reality that I think if you are truly living as a faithful Christian and you desire to follow the will and, and the teachings and the life of Jesus and his gospel and the law that God has had handed down to us, I think you have major problems and hang-ups with both political parties in this country. And I think if we are really honest with ourselves and with our faith, that is the reality. But the gospel, again, is God works through all of this. And as we are called to care for others, others are called to care for us, and everything is within God's hand. And that's something I want to keep coming back to because I think the the biggest takeaway from this is we ought to be putting our faith in God, not in politics. So, I I do apologize on that section that it wasn't as grounded in scripture as I usually stick to. Like I said, I can back up each of those issues from scripture, but this podcast has already been going for nearly a half hour and uh, I still have an entire section left. So, Continuing forward into our epistle for today, it comes from 1 Corinthians 1. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, 
but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians here, and that's the context of this, and he's talking about divisions in the church. And you may say, well, divisions in the church and and political divisions are different, and the reality is I wish this didn't apply to politics. I wish political divisions didn't impact the church, but I think it does. Because the application here isn't saying I follow Paul or I follow Apollos. It's I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. When the reality is neither party is united with our faith in the same mind and same judgment. And the reality is, is Christ divided? That question still rings out thousands of years later. And the answer is no. So, when we come down to political parties, do you have to be one party or the other? No. We, we know Christ and him alone. Are you free to take part in politics? Yes, but not as an idol. It shouldn't identify who you are. And it shouldn't separate you from other parts of the body of Christ. So in in reality, when we're interacting with people, if you are a Republican interacting with Democrats or you're a Democrat interacting with a Republican or you're either party and you're interacting with people like me, love for neighbors should come first. And in reality, we have to stop pretending that one party is holier than the other because all sin is the same. All have fallen short. So... No party is really better than the other. No party is more Christian than the other. So the reality is we shouldn't identify ourselves by political parties. Again, we can't put a political party in in the place of God. It, It should not be an idol. Because the reality is we are all fallen creatures. And political parties are incredibly tempting as idols or as qualifiers for how we care about people. I don't want to serve someone if they don't agree with me. I don't want to I don't want to serve, I don't want to love, I don't want to work with someone who believes blank. That's not what we're called to. We're called to love our neighbor and to serve our neighbor. And we're called to be unified in Christ. And that's the gospel I want to leave you on today. The spirit is what unifies us. And we are united under the sacrifice of Christ because we are all fallen creatures. That is true. And each and every one of us, uh, every politician, every, every voter, every non-voter, every person listening to this podcast, we're all broken. And before God, we're all equally broken. But the beauty is that Christ took all of that brokenness into himself on the cross. And because he was willing to make that sacrifice for us, we have a relationship with God where he forgives us. And he calls us together into one big family. So with that, this has been my episode on politics. Um, Not as neat as uh, some of my episodes have been, but I hope it was helpful to you. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any concerns, please follow up with me. If you have any topics that you want to hear about in, in addition to this, or even unrelated to this, if you have a, a discussion that you want me to walk through, please comment on whatever platform you listen on. We are on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Podbean, and on iTunes. Or message me on Facebook or email me. That's vicar at com. In whatever the case, I, I again, I hope this was helpful. Give us a subscribe to our page if this is what you would like to hear more of and give us a like if you appreciate the podcast anyway 
with all that being said brothers and sisters this has been real politics real gospel go in peace and serve the lord thanks be to god